Well, this is the maiden voyage of our of our new uh, studio, Mark, and it's a pleasure to have you here, Mark Thornton. It's great to be with you, Jeff. We'll see how this goes. Um, I like the sort of low tech, or I guess it's sort of a high tech background. We we got rid of the library books and whatever else is usually in the backgrounds for these sort of things, and it's just reality TV in a way. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, so now to reality. Uh, Prop nineteen in California, a measure that would have legalized pot. Uh, growing consumption, it went down to defeat. Yes, it went down to defeat in the recent election. Uh, it got 46% of the vote, though, which is is a very good showing. This is the first time it's ever been on the ballot. And it's a really major piece of legislation, legalizing marijuana. Now, of course, there's a lot of marijuana growing and consumption in California already. But the fact that the people would overturn a federal law in defiance of federal law and a United Nations treaty that maintains the drug war, that's a, big, um, that's a big piece of legislation. How many people are in prison right now for growing and consuming pot and trading and uh, distributing pot? I mean, there's a lot, right? Oh, yeah, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands. In yeah. fact, probably, if you looked at the entire drug war, well over a million people. Yeah. And, of course, we have the highest percentage of our population in jail, in prison, and the majority of it is for illegal drugs, and nonviolent offenses. And, um, and pot is preeminent among those. Oh, yes. It's the vast majority of all. Yeah, so we've got a ridiculous situation where pot is a huge cash crop. It's a mass, massive uh, economic uh, a boon to the, to the world. And yet it's, it's illegal. So it's, it's kind of like prohibition, obviously. Oh, yes. It is a prohibition. Yeah. And it's not just marijuana for marijuana consumption, but the plant itself can be used for all sorts of things, textiles, oils animal feed, uh, you know, its uses in terms of helping the economy are virtually endless in the things that it can do. Now, the, uh, the, you say it was the, the first legislation to, to ever be put on the ballot like this that would have just had an open legalization of pot? Uh, no other state has done anything like this? This is the first time that I'm aware of yeah. that a proposition was put yeah. to the voters. Yeah, so it's exciting. It's historic. Um, and 46% is, is substantial. Um, but how did the voting uh, come out from your analysis of it? Well, a lot of people thought that it would pass, actually. Um, 46% is good for any proposition its first time around. It had a lot of um, people knew that it was on the ballot. People were well informed, and only 10% were really undecided as of Election Day. Uh, the problem started to occur when people started to look at the ramifications of legalization. For example, the people who grow pot illegally right now initially thought the idea was really cool if we could legalize pot and then they realized that they were totally dependent for their incomes on illegal pot prices and that they would likely be displaced entirely um, in a legal marketplace and so we saw the pot growers the pot dealers coming out against legalization we saw the marijuana medical marijuana dispensary people come out against... Yeah, why would they be against it? How would it? Well, I guess it would have driven out their... What? Their prices? Their prices uh, would have fallen too and they would have been hurt too, the medical dispensaries? Well, the, the medical marijuana use would be much more limited and people wouldn't have to have a doctor's permission and, and have that legal cover. And marijuana could be just sold in stores, any, you know, lots of different stores. And so uh, they, they actually said that they were against it because they thought it would reduce their patients' access to marijuana. They thought they thought that... <laughs> access to their marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> right. Access to their, yeah, their, their marijuana, exactly, which is, you know, is probably above what would, the price there would be above what the market would produce. Now, the, the proposition would have, would have taxed marijuana. It would have uh, provided, I, mean, I don't know, you had limits on how much you could grow, it would have limited public consumption. So 
to some extent, I mean, there were some valid reasons to be against Prop 19, right? Oh, yeah, just as there's valid reasons to be against these taxes and regulations and restrictions okay. on any good and service that we have in the United I States see. economy. Yeah. So, so to your mind, that's not a good reason to keep it illegal or to fail to legalize it just because there's going to be taxes and regulations and no, controls but th- on it. No, those are trivial reasons. Yeah. Those are excuses yeah, I see. Uh, to protect these people's self-interest. The more important goal here is to legalize a product that most people consider dangerous and to show that the normal functioning society is not hindered in any way, shape, or form so that the people in the other states can realize that, hey, we might want to do the smart thing too and legalize marijuana and cut down the burdens on our prisons and our police and our court system and stop breaking up minority families and all the social problems that are brought about from marijuana Uh, prohibition. And then if people get the idea that, you know, nullifying in effect by a vote of the people, these silly federal regulations and controls and prohibitions, it could spread like wildfire. Yeah, that that is extraordinarily radical. But I I just just want to focus on, on the point that you make in terms of libertarian strategy here. I think it's, I'm only just now thinking through this. So for example, if milk were illegal, um, and a proposition on the ballot said, well, let's make milk legal, uh, but as part of that, milk's going to be subsidized or maybe price controlled. To your mind, that's, that's regrettable that th- those, those controls are in place, but still no excuse for not making milk legal. That's right? correct. Right. And, and actually, actually, milk is illegal in the United States. If you try to, <laughs> if you try to yeah. uh, produce raw milk and sell it, yeah. you'd be thrown in jail. But I, you know, that's certainly right. Um, but I think your 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 manner of thinking about this is is important. I hadn't really considered it in those terms. That it's nonetheless a step in the direction of liberty to to have a state in which uh, the pot is is uh, considered to be a normal commodity, right? Uh, a normal consumption good like any other. And let the market develop, the mm-hmm. institutions develop, and let's show the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Yeah that it turns out to be perfectly normal. Yeah. Now, what do you make of the, the – I heard some people say, well, look, it's not going to cut down on criminal gangs because it's only going to be legal in California. There's still a problem in you know, Utah or whatever, you know, other states. Uh, how, what do you make of that? Well, that's right. There will be gangs, but yeah. there will be much fewer gang activity yeah. in yeah. California. Um, and yeah. one of the interesting things was that uh, the president of Mexico and the president of Colombia – both came out against Proposition 19 yeah. <laughs> because, uh, of course, their governments make a lot of money from the U.S. enforcing the drug war, yeah. and their economies generate huge amounts of cash because of illegal sales into the United States to places like California. If Proposition 19 passed, the price of marijuana would fall dramatically, and people would be far less um, interested in paying the high price of cocaine and so the business south of the border would also be harmed right. uh, tremendously. Now, uh, to your mind, as you're looking towards the future, if this comes up again, what is going to make the margin of difference to cause it to be to pass next time around? Just ideological change, people persuaded that, well, maybe it wouldn't be so bad after all. Yeah, demographics are going to help. Uh-huh. Uh, we're, you know, as the younger people come up, uh, they realize that marijuana prohibition is stupid and harmful. Yeah. And uh, they'll have more um, experience uh, with the process. And uh, what they need is a little bit more money. I think there was a lot of intimidation by politicians uh, for high-profile celebrities and uh, financiers to stop donating money to this project. And we have, in fact, have some evidence that people who initially supported it Somehow or another, stop Back funding away. it. Yeah, it's just really uh, fun to imagine what kind of what would have been the fallout from passage. Well, the one thing that's going to be um, hard to judge is that um, you know Eric Holder, the Attorney General of the United States, said we're going to enforce marijuana prohibition anyways, even if it passes. Uh-huh. That's an idle threat, basically. But Governor Schwarzenegger also tried to undermine it by uh, pass, passing a law and signing into legislation a law that made possession of marijuana just a a minor violation subject to a small fine. So they've tried to take the carrot and the stick approach to prevent Californians from voting for what they think is the right thing to do. And so 
And the, you know, and the carrot and the stick approach won this time. But I think uh, next time around, they're already planning right. to get back on the ballot. And if they get the financial resources uh, necessary to promote the campaign and to get the knowledge across of what legal marijuana would be like, then I think it's going to be a vic- um, victory. You, before we started this interview, we were talking uh, ahead about some of the propaganda that was coming out about the, the fears that people had. Well, truck truck drivers would be dri- driving around stoned, and and nurses in hospitals would be smoking pot. Um, kids would become just cooled, uh, stoned, whatever. Um, now. Uh, uh, in each of these cases, it doesn't sound any different from the present situation. I mean, obviously, some kids at school are stoned, and obviously, hospitals will forbid nurses from walking into operating rooms with with uh, having smoked pot and so on. Yeah, um, this this is the this is the Baptist side of the Baptist and bootlegger yeah. model. It's a it's a it's basically essentially a moral objection. Now, I, I know a lot of people, a lot of people I know, just say, oh, "God, why would anybody want to legalize pot? That stuff is so tacky. I hate those people." I mean, this is right. Do you know what I mean? This attitude that oh God, those potheads. What? You know who cares about them? Well, that's the result of Cheech and Chong movies, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the uh, the moralizing side of the equation was the churches that came out, yeah. the religious organizations that came out, uh, the Chamber of Commerce that came out, uh, the California beer distributors came out against this measure with all sorts of seemingly uh, you know, arguments, uh, but they were all basically silly arguments. I mean, the the California Brewers Association was was worried that their truck drivers would be driving around smoking yeah. marijuana, which yeah. doesn't say very much about their beer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, all of these arguments were fallacious. Mm-hmm. Um, in a with a legalized uh, environment, uh, you know, employers can prevent their employees from smoking pot. Mm-hmm. Uh, just as they can prevent them from drinking. Uh, we prevent pilots from drinking. We prevent doctors from drinking. We prevent all sorts of professions. Um, and insurance companies mandate it, right. you know, that you can't smoke pot and drive right. heavy, machi- heavy machinery right. around. Not, so, not, not many organizations are as liberally minded as the Mises Institute. Say, would you like a martini? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So the, they, they came up with all sorts of ludicrous and untrue um, arguments about the law and about what things would be like um, that were just were just simply untrue uh, right. to make uh, this, this sort of moral point. Well, it must have given you a sense of deja vu. Was deja vu. You're a scholar of the great of the um, of prohibition, the first pro- alcohol prohibition. You saw you've studied extensively all the arguments going into prohibition during and the arguments for repeal. Of prohibition in 1932, 33. Right. So, um, a major part of the argument for repeal was that look, if we uh, treat this as a normal commodity, we'll be able to tax it, and uh, the budget strains of local governments can can help to be um, uh, relaxed a little bit. Was that revenue argument made with regard to pot? Oh yes. I mean, there, there was actual studies done that showed that if California legalized it and all the jurisdictions taxed it at a certain rate, that Governments would get it a combined, you know, so many millions yeah. or billions of dollars. I don't know why that wouldn't be persuasive. I mean, there's obviously in California, we've got a fiscal disaster taking place, right? Right. And that's one of the reasons why I wasn't surprised to see this proposition come up in the first place, yeah. because I've been looking all along for, you know, a major economic crisis to lead to calls for legalizing things like marijuana. Right. Uh, which does two things to the fiscal equation uh, for government, which is to raise revenues and to cut costs. Now, it also, of course, um, is beneficial to the average common man on the street, too, because it's going to reduce uh, their prices. It's going to um, you know, do all sorts of positive things in the economy itself. So it's a win-win proposition, but uh, it's especially a win-win uh, proposition for the budget of the government. And so if we get into a major crisis like we are, and we have to pay our bills like California and state governments have to, then we should expect uh, that legalization would be have a much better opportunity of being passed. To, to your mind, is that is, is that the fiscal argument that finally tipped the, the political balance in favor of, of repealing prohibition in 1933? Oh, yes, I think so. Uh, you know, 
we would never have had prohibition in the first place in, in alcohol in the 1920s had we not passed the income tax a few years prior. That revenue that was coming in from the income tax made prohibition possible. Uh, alcohol, al <clears throat> excuse me, alcohol taxes made up about 20% of government revenue. Oh, and that's so, interesting. So it really is a, a tipping point. And, of course, I don't want to see heavy taxes on alcohol and marijuana or anything for that matter, but um, if it gets us in the direction of more liberty and more sanity, uh, the idea that people are going to to jail and to prison by the hundreds of thousands R right. for smoking a marijuana cigarette mm -hmm. is ludicrous. Right. When was pot actually uh, made illegal? Uh, marijuana became illegal at the national level in the United States with the passage of the 1938 Marijuana Tax Bill. It was um, signed as a tax bill, just as the Harrison Narcotic um, Act uh, was a tax bill. They had to get around the constitutional issues, so they called it a tax, but then they flipped over, and as soon as it was passed, they made it into a prohibition. Mm -hmm. So we repealed prohibition on one thing and imposed on another five years later. That's right. Uh, and the reason uh, is, is that um, alcohol prohibition was repealed uh, because of the f financial aspects, uh, but also because everybody was aware of what drinking was really about. They weren't afraid of going back to a country where there was drinking. Mm -hmm. But with marijuana, it was nobody knew anything about it. They, they were given misinformation by the government bureaucrats. Uh, who were looking for a job, basically. Right. And, uh, you know, they said that minority groups, you know, smoked it and did all sorts of nasty, crazy things, yeah. which was not really true. Well, now, you see, uh, I was watching a movie the other day. It was made in 1929. There's a big party going on. Everybody's drinking in the party, you know, freely and openly. And there wasn't even a sense of taboo about it. And that's 1929, during Prohibition. They weren't even knocking on doors giving secret passwords or anything. It's just out in the open. And it's, similarly, uh, it's true also with marijuana today. It's kind of part of our culture in some way, right? It's featured in movies. Everybody just, I mean, even politicians will get up and say, well, it's true, I smoked marijuana when I was young, but that was stupid or whatever. It seems like we're kind of on the cusp of something big happening with regard to legalization. I think so. Uh, I think the, um, the stars are aligning themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, our government is maintaining all of its silly programs and so forth uh, by huge deficit spending, um, that eventually uh, has to come to an end. Right. And uh, as it is in terms of state governments, mm -hmm. they're going to have to do something. And marijuana prohibition is the stupidest, um, most costly program on the docket. And they can, you can really generate large amounts of money and you can save huge amounts of money. And so I think the stars are aligning themselves in favor right. of the legalization. But the other day you wrote about all the political benefits that came to FDR from having repealed prohibition on alcohol. He suddenly became enormously popular after some, some, uh, some doubt, and it was one of his first political priorities. And, and he benefited for many years after that, seen as a liberator of the people because he got rid of prohibition. Do you think that a politician today uh, could similarly benefit politically? Oh, yes. Uh, Champion the cause of legalization of marijuana? I believe so. With FDR, it was happy days are here again, of course. Yeah. And uh, he was a dry, uh, but changed over to becoming a wet at the last moment in order to get the presidential nomination in 1932. And then he made legalization or repeal uh, his highest priority and dealt with it in the opening days of his administration. Uh, and he was instantly a huge hit. Hoover had been really stunk up the place. And he was dry, right? Hoover was, Hoover was definitely dry. dry. He was <laughs> bone dry. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, FDR goes in there and uh, makes it a priority, um, you know, and gives it to the people. And the people love him and adore him. Uh, you know, they, they didn't really care for you know, the New Deal stuff. Hoover had already tried all that and it didn't work. Right. But at least you could get a drink now. Yeah, yeah. So with all the pain, it's something that affected everybody. Unlike um, whatever Tennessee Valley Authority or whatever. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Just a few people who lost yeah. their homes or whatever. Right. Uh, and so today, I think the time is right too, because 
you have both political parties uh, really not knowing the direction of their future and the independent voters in the middle being the swing vote. We've clearly seen this in all of the last several elections that the independent voters matter and the independent voters are practical people and uh, they're afraid of marijuana. Um, but on the other hand, I think that they're open-minded enough to be convinced by things like new sources of revenue, less prison overcrowding, right. smaller budgets, uh, you know, and with the general normal restrictions on marijuana that applies to every other product, mm -hmm. I think they'll go for it. Yeah. And I think that politicians, um, once we see that switch, um, you're going to see a landslide. And what happened with Prop 19 is all the pop politicians lined up against it. The governor, the governor's oh, candidates, the Senate yeah. candidates, the attorney general candidates, uh, Speaker Pelosi, you know, they all went negative on it. And even then it still got 46%. So right. That's extraordinary. Yeah, everybody, everybody was being told not to vote for this, yeah. that there was no good reason to vote for it. And I think what has to happen now, between now and the next time that it's voted on, is for people to get uh, better information about um, – and, and, and to have these these lies and these untrue uh, things about the legalization of marijuana for that information to get out there. I can easily see that one or two big shots coming out saying, look, this doesn't seem like such a bad thing at all. I mean, it seems like uh, something we should we should favor. It could, could actually make a big difference. Well, and unfortunately, this happened only a couple of days before the election, so it d didn't really get out. But an international team of scientists were asked to come in and, you know, and explain where on the spectrum of social danger marijuana lies and it was way on down the list alcohol was much higher oh, all of sure. the, all the other illegal drugs uh and some illegal drugs were much higher than marijuana according to this international team of scientists that's the type of information that needs to get out there uh, marijuana is clearly a safer recreational drug than alcohol um and uh and many other uh, other, <clears throat> other of these drugs so it's ridiculous if we if we can get a safe drug out on the out on the business world where it's inexpensive and people have easy access to it the demand for all of these other more dangerous and socially harmful drugs is going to be lowered and so the benefits really of legalizing marijuana are just multifaceted and uh once that message gets out once people realize the self-interest of these california pot growers uh and of the president of Mexico and uh, the attorney general of California, uh, you know, once you have their self-interest placed in front of you, you realize that you've just been taken from a ride, uh, for a ride by the state. Yeah. Well, very good. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate your being with us today. I enjoyed it, Jeff. Thank you. Mm -hmm.